problem is even when we know what to do, we don't do it. That the Greek philosopher Plato talked about this problem 2,500 years ago. So we know for at least the past 2,500 years, people have been struggling with distraction. So just because it's a work-related task doesn't mean it's not a distraction. That's the worst kind of distraction because you don't even realize you're distracted. It turns out that 90% of the time that you get distracted, it's not because of a ping, ding, or ring, but rather it's because of an internal trigger. It's not about what's happening outside of us. Let's just say my screen time is really high. Now, how do I implement these four steps to reduce my screen time? People at the top of their game, athletes, business leaders, artists, what you will find is they feel the same exact internal triggers the rest of us do, but they act differently when they feel them. This is called time boxing and it will change your life. And I want you to do this for your entire day, for every minute of your day, because this is the only way we don't live a life of regret. Hell to me is looking back on your life and saying, Ugh, I could have done so much more. I could have been so much better. And work has two types. There's two kinds of work. We have what's called reactive work and we have reflective work. To-do lists, did you know to-do lists are one of the worst things you can do for your personal productivity? And you start thinking, I'm no good at time management. No, it's not you that's no good at time management. It's this stupid time management technique that doesn't work. So we should be generous with our money because we can always make more, but cheap with our time. But for most people, it's the opposite. I don't feel like doing it. And then I feel right. guilty for not having enough discipline. So how do I fix that? Uh, you know what the number one reason people don't achieve their goals is? What's the number one reason? It's pretty common sense. The number one reason people don't achieve their goals is because... Welcome to The Cutting Edge Show. Today's guest is Nireal, one of the most popular authors in the world of design and product building. He has an MBA from Stanford, he has taught marketing at Stanford, and is now the author of two highly successful books, Hooked and Indistractable. He's an extremely smart investor and consultant for a variety of tech companies around the world. In this episode, Neil teaches us how to achieve more in life, how to be less distracted. He gave away an amazing variety of brain hacks and mental models that you can use to get your focus back and be more productive and live a better life. We're also running a giveaway where once you document your learnings from this video and post on LinkedIn or Instagram, you will stand a chance to win both of his books, Hooked and indistractable. The rules for the giveaway are in description and the pinned comment. Three winners will be shortlisted by my team to win both of Nireal's books. So without wasting any further time, let's get started. Greetings everyone. Welcome to the Cutting Edge Show. Today's guest is someone who has inspired so many product builders and designers. He is the author of every product builder's all-time favorite book, Hooked. I am talking about the OG author, Neer Eyal. Neer, welcome to the Cutting Edge Show. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm so happy that you agreed to do this because when we announced this to our audiences that you are coming on the show, they just lost it because so many <laughs> students have read and have learned from you. Like, how does it feel to have that kind of an impact? <laughs> I don't know, actually. <laughs> I, I, uh, you don't see it really. Uh, you know, I'm just living my life and uh, writing and researching and uh, I don't feel it unless someone tells me about it. So thank you for letting me know that uh, that the work is impacting people's lives. That's a, that's a huge compliment. Thank you. When I told everyone that Neer is coming on the show and I asked them, what would you like to ask? Almost everyone had a similar question that, how do we get our focus back? Because mm. everyone is having such a difficult time staying focused. So how do we fix this? Yeah, so this is exactly what Indistractable is all about. Uh, and, and listen, I wrote the book for me more than anyone else. I needed to know the answer to this question that you're asking exactly of how do we stop getting so distracted? Because the problem of our age is no longer that we don't know what to do. Most people know what to do, right? If you want to get in shape, you have to eat right and exercise. Does anybody not know that? Do we need to buy a diet book to tell us that? We know already. If you want to have better relationships with your family. You have to be fully present with the people you love. If you want to do well in business, you have to do the hard work that other people don't want to do. We already know this. What we don't know is how to stop getting in our own way, right? You can Google all the answers. All the answers are out there for free. The problem is even when we know what to do, we don't do it. 
that's the real problem. And that was certainly my problem as well. You know, I, I found that after my, my first book, Hooked, uh, got some amount of success, I was being pulled to speaking engagements and investments and uh, uh, all kinds of projects and, and all kinds of interesting things that were great. But it took me away from the one thing that I really wanted to continue that made me successful in the first place was the writing and researching that I needed to do to move my career forward. And then it, it really came to a head, actually, when I was with my daughter one afternoon. And uh, we had some daddy-daughter time planned, just some quality time together. And I remember we had this activity book of fun things that dads and daughters could do together. And one of the things in the book was to ask each other this question. If you could have any superpower, what superpower would you want? And I remember that question verbatim, but I can't tell you what my daughter said. Because in that moment, for whatever reason, I just had to do this one thing on my phone real quick. And by the time I looked up from my device, she was gone. Because I was sending a very clear message that whatever was on my phone was more important than she was. And she went to go play with some toy outside. And so that's when I really had to reassess my own relationship with not only technology, but distraction in general. Because if I'm honest with you, it didn't just happen with her. It would happen when I would say, oh, I'm definitely going to work on that big project. And yet I would procrastinate and do everything but the thing I said I was going to do. It would happen when I'd say I was going to exercise and eat right, but I didn't and I wouldn't. And so that's what I really wanted to answer for myself. Why is it that despite knowing what we what to do, we don't do it? And so I actually went way back to first principles, right? Really to the foundation of, of this problem of distraction. It turns out that the Greek philosopher Plato talked about this problem 2,500 years ago. So we know for at least the past 2,500 years, people have been struggling with distraction. So that means therefore that it can't be caused just because of our mobile devices, right? If people have been complaining about distraction for 2,500 years, the internet didn't cause distraction. It's always been part of the human condition. And so I really wanted to get to, to, to first principles by first understanding what is distraction, right? Let's really understand what this term means. And so the best way to understand if you know what distraction is, is to ask yourself, what is the opposite of distraction? Most people say the opposite of distraction is focus, right? I don't wanna be distracted, I wanna be focused. But that's not exactly right. The opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction, if you look at the origin of the word, is traction. Of course it is, we have traction, and we have distraction. Traction is any action that pulls you towards what you say you're going to do. Things that you do with intent, things that move you closer to your values and help you become the kind of person you want to become. Those are acts of traction. The opposite of traction, distraction, is any action that pulls you away from what you plan to do, further away from your goals, further away from becoming the kind of person you want to become. So this is really, really important. This isn't just semantics because I would argue, as Dorothy Parker said, the time you plan to waste is not wasted time. So if you want to go on social media, if you want to watch YouTube, if you want to uh, play video games, there's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. We need to stop moralizing and medicalizing the technology. There's nothing wrong with technology. It's great. It's a tool just like any other tool. If you use it according to your schedule and your values, certainly not the tech companies. So there's nothing wrong with using these technologies. We need to stop vilifying them and rather say, look, if I plan ahead for them, if that's something I decide to do with my time and attention, great, enjoy it, guilt-free, because now you've turned distraction into traction. And we'll talk about exactly how to do that in a minute. Now, just because something is a work-related task doesn't mean it's not a distraction. Tell me if this sounds familiar. For years, I would sit down at my desk and I'd say, okay, I've got that big project I need to work on right now. Nothing's gonna get in my way. I'm gonna get started. Here I go. I'm not gonna get distracted. Here I go. But first, let me check some email. <laughs> right? Let me just scroll that Slack channel. Let me just see what's happening in the day's industry news because that's stuff I have to do anyway, right? And turns out that if it's not what you plan to do in advance, those work-related tasks are just as much of a distraction, maybe even more so because you don't even realize that distraction has tricked you into prioritizing the easy work and the urgent work at the expense of the hard and important work you have to do to move your life and career forward. So just because it's a work-related task doesn't mean it's not a distraction. That's the worst kind of distraction because you don't even realize you're distracted. So now to answer your question, we've got a model we can build. We've got traction, we've got distraction. Now we need to ask ourselves, what pulls us towards traction and distraction? Well, we've got two kinds of triggers. The first kind of trigger is what we call external triggers, the things outside of us, the pings, the dings, the rings. This is what people tend to blame. They say, my phone distracted me, my kids distracted me, my boss, so all these things outside of us distracted. Those are called external triggers. But it turns out that studies find that external triggers are only 10% of the time we get distracted. Only 10% of the time that you get off track is it because of an external trigger. Well, what's the other 90%? 
turns out that 90% of the time that you get distracted, it's not because of a ping, ding, or ring, but rather it's because of an internal trigger. It's not about what's happening outside of us, but 90% of the time we get distracted, it's about what's happening inside of us. And here we get to, I think, the, the most important truth of my over a decade of, of research and what no other book on the topic really tells you. Every other book on the topic and expert on the topic says it's your phone, put your phone away, stop using technology. And I don't think that's true. Because even when I did that, even when I got rid of the technology, guess what? I still got distracted. I still found something because I wasn't dealing with the feelings that were distracting me, that were pulling me off course. So the first step to becoming indistractable is to master those internal triggers or they will become your master. Because 90% of the time that we get distracted, it's simply a response to a feeling. Boredom, loneliness, fatigue, uncertainty, stress, anxiety. If we don't know how to control those emotions, they will control us. So what you have to do, if you wanna become indistractable, the very first and most important step is to have tools at your disposal, to have arrows in your quiver, ready to go, so that when you feel discomfort, are you gonna do what indistractable people do? Which is they use that discomfort as rocket fuel towards traction, or are you going to do what distractible people do, which is try and escape every uncomfortable emotion? Oh, I don't like being bored. Let me check my phone. Oh, I don't like uncertainty. Let me look at the news. Oh, I don't like being lonely. Let me scroll something. Or do you learn to deal with that discomfort in a healthy way that helps you, that makes you a better person because you're better able to deal with that discomfort? So now to answer your question, I mean, it took me you know, a long time. It took me five years to write this book, so it's hard to answer it very succinctly. So it took me five years to write the book, by the way, because I kept getting distracted right? It wasn't until I learned these techniques for myself and adopted them into my life that now my life is 180 degrees different, right? So much better. I'm in the best shape of my life at about to be 46 years old. Uh, I'm more productive at work. I have a better relationship with my family and friends, all because I say I do, I, I do as I say, I am indistractable. So the way you become indistractable, now we have these four steps. You master internal triggers, you make time for traction, you hack back external triggers and you prevent distraction with packs. Those are the four steps to becoming indistractable. The rest is, how do you do that? If I had to pick a very practical problem statement, let's just say my screen time is really high. Now, how do I implement these four steps to reduce my screen time? Well, let's, let's go even more specific. Let's talk about a specific distraction that you have in your life. The screen time is the symptom, okay? Let's, let's diagnose the, the disease. So tell me something that you wanted to do that you went off track because you checked your screen. I think my day-to-day -day life is very slow and anytime I open Instagram, there's something new or fancy. So I just want to be like stimulated or just be shown something new all the time. Right. Okay. So let's back up here. Okay. So it's interesting. You said every time I want to feel something new. So you're struggling with boredom. That's Correct. The I get bored right. super easily. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So that's the most important first step. Okay. First step is you need tools. You need uh, techniques so that when you feel bored, you don't try and escape that discomfort you lean into that discomfort. So when I interviewed for my book, people at the top of their game, athletes, business leaders, artists, what you will find is they feel the same exact internal triggers the rest of us do. They feel bored, they feel lonely, they feel depressed, they feel anxious, they feel stressed. They feel all the same things we feel, but they act differently when they feel them. Distractible people, as soon as we feel bored, we need to escape. We need a drink, we need a television, we need a scroll, we need a click. What indistractable people do is they use that discomfort. So that's what, you, well, that's what you'll have to do, right? That's what all of us have to do. That's what I had to do, was to figure out, okay, when I feel bored, what's a healthier behavior that I can partake in, okay? So that's step number one. We can talk about some very specific techniques of what to do. Second thing is, what did you get distracted from? So tell me a time, be very specific, when you said on your calendar, you were gonna do one thing, and instead you checked Instagram. So I would try to do something and be like, oh, this is taking too much time. I think I need a break. And then I would just okay. switch to Instagram because it's more comfortable. Now, did you have it on your calendar to work on that task? No. Or did you just say, oh, I'll get to it sometime today? No, I would just be like, okay. anytime I have time, I would just do it. Bingo. Listen very carefully. You cannot call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. I'll say it again. You can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So if you look at your calendar and you haven't planned out what you wanna do with your time and attention, you can't say you got distracted because what did you get distracted from? So the key here is to say, I am going to, what, what was the thing you said you wanna do that you got bored from? Writing a script. Writing a script, perfect. So what I want you to do for tomorrow, it's too late for today, but for tomorrow, I want you to put in your calendar 30 minutes, 
20 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes, I don't care. However amount of time you want to work on that script without distraction. Now, this is called time boxing and it will change your life. And I want you to do this for your entire day, for every minute of your day, because this is the only way, this is so important, this is the only way we can assure we don't live a life of regret. That's the ultimate curse, right? The hell to me is looking back on your life and saying, ugh, I could have done so much more. I could have been so much better. That is the only reason I do what I do. I want to prevent people, starting with myself, from having that. I don't want to do that then in my life and say, ugh, I could have done better. I could have done more. I could have been a better person. The only way to prevent regret is to decide in advance how you want to spend your time. How do you do that? Well, you do it based on your values. What are values? Values are defined as attributes of the person you want to become. I'll say that again. Values are attributes of the person you want to become. So I want you to ask yourself, how would the person that you want to become spend their time? Now, I personally don't care how you spend your time. I'm not one of these gurus that says you need eight hours of sleep and you need to exercise and you need to take cold baths and you take, I don't care. (laughs) You can play video games 24 hours a day, that's fine. But I want you to do that with intent. I want you to decide in advance, that's how I want to spend my time. So I want you to look at your calendar and I want you to say, okay, how much time would the person I want to become spend writing a a script? How much time would that person spend having dinner with their family? How much time would that person that I want to become spend on Instagram? Did you know one of the best things you can do to prevent distraction is to turn distraction into traction by putting it on your calendar. I want you to put time in your calendar, just as I do, for social media because now, When you're checking Instagram, it's not a distraction. What's it distracting you from? You said on your calendar you were gonna check uh, uh, Instagram, and you did. Now it's traction. What this prevents is you ruminating uh, on it all day. Oh, when do I get to check Instagram? When do I get to check? Did anybody message me? No problem. I know that I will check it at a certain time of day. Now you can check it five times a day for all I care. Doesn't matter. But decide in advance when you're gonna check it. The same with email. The same with Slack messages. The same with phone calls. Put that time in your schedule, okay? So the way you do this is you think about your values based on these three life domains. You, you are the center of your three life domains. So those involve, you know, if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of other people. You can't make the world a better place. So how much time do you want to read books, to pray, to meditate, to draw, to take a walk, to exercise, to eat right? Put that on your calendar first. Then your relationships, okay? Your friends, your significant other, your kids, your parents, your siblings, how much time does the person you want to become spend with them? And I'm not telling you how much time to put. It could be zero, it could be all day. doesn't matter to me, but decide in advance. Then finally, the work domain. And work has two types. There's two kinds of work. We have what's called reactive work and we have reflective work. Reactive work is reacting to notifications, reacting to messages, reacting to colleagues. That's part of everybody's day, okay? And we can plan for that time. Now, most of your day, for most of us, is going to be spent doing reactive work, right? The problem is people get habituated to that because they don't like thinking. Human brains don't like thinking. Thinking is hard work. People like to be told what to do by themselves, not by other people, but we like to have that answer question. So as opposed to thinking, hmm, what's the best thing I can do with my time? What are my goals? Where am I going in life? Oh, that's scary. That's, that, that, that doesn't sound fun. I'll just check my email inbox. My email inbox will tell me what to do. Well, that's terrible. <laughs> You're letting other people with other interests and other values guide your life. Why are you giving them control of the wheel? That's terrible. So what you have to do is to make at least some time in your day for what's called reflective work. Reflective work is the kind of work that can only be done without distraction. Planning, strategizing, being creative, thinking for God's sakes requires you to work without distraction. So whether it's 10 minutes, an hour, four hours, doesn't matter. You have to put that time in your calendar and protect it as if you were meeting the most famous person on the planet, right? When I ask people, say, let's say uh, the president of your country, let's say Oprah Winfrey, let's say Tom Cruise, I don't know, somebody you admire very much says, hey, I'd love to have lunch with you. Would you pick up the phone in the middle of a lunch with your your hero? No, right? But when it comes to my time, oh, oh, okay, sure. Instagram, notification, emails, phone calls, sure, whatever. Interrupt me whenever you want. But you're the most important person person in your world. And so why don't you give yourself the same respect? We have to. Okay, so step number one, when it, when it comes to this exact problem that we're talking about in terms of, oh, I'm checking Instagram and I didn't plan on it. Step number one is to have those tools ready to deal with the uncom- uncomfortable sensations of boredom, okay, in your case. 
whatever the, it could it, for other people it might be something else it might be uncertainty it might be loneliness it might be fatigue there are all kinds of internal triggers so having a strategy to deal with that and i thought there's that's the most important section of the book it's the biggest section of the book there's over a dozen different techniques you can use the second step is to make time for traction so in the future as opposed to oh yeah i'll write the script sometime today it's nope i'm gonna write the script from 9 a.m to 9 30. and here's the kicker the people who do that by the way are actually finish more than the people who use to-do lists. To-do lists, did you know to-do lists are one of the worst things you can do for your personal productivity? Because to-do lists have no constraints. You can always add more to a to-do list. And there's nothing wrong, just to be clear, there's nothing wrong with getting stuff out of your head and onto a piece of paper or into an app. That's great, but that's where most people end, right? They think, oh, I have this big long list of to-dos, but that's horrible because you'll never finish all those to-dos. So what happens? Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, you look at this big long list of things you didn't do, loser, and you start thinking, I'm no good at time management. No, it's not you that's no good at time management. That's this stupid time management technique that doesn't work, right? Because there's no constraint. But a calendar has a constraint. We all have 24 hours in a day, right? Think about how cheap people are with money, right? They look for deals and they, they haggle each other. They split checks at lunch, right? We always try and save a buck, right? But you can always make more money. You can always make more money. But I don't care if you're Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, you can't make more time. You only have 24 hours in a day. So we should be generous with our money because we can always make more, but cheap with our time. But for most people, it's the opposite. We give away time to whoever wants it. Sure, whatever, whatever. But we should be very stingy with our time because we can't make more time, but we can make more money. So we need to be just as judicious about you know planning our, our budget as we are with spending our time. So that's step number two is making time for traction. Step number three is now hacking back those external triggers. And for you, it's very, very simple. If you find your problem is, is Instagram, there's a very, very so simple solution, right? You can put your phone in another room, right? You can take Instagram off your phone. I use Instagram. I don't use it on my phone. I don't want Instagram on my phone. I use it on my desktop because I don't want the, the temptation, the external trigger of something pinging or dinging me. I use do not disturb. Every time I'm doing work, it automatically, it's constantly on all day long. I use, I take it off when I want to use the phone, right? So there's all kinds of things you can do to hack back these external triggers. A lot of very, very simple things you can do. And then finally, prevent distraction with pacts. A pact is when you make a pre-commitment in advance. Okay, so a lot of times people talk to me and they say, Nir, you don't understand. I'm so easily distracted. I just, I just can't stop, right? I just can't stop. These, these things are so good. They're addicting me. They're hijacking my brain. And frankly, it's bullshit. It's, it's just not true. And how do I know it's not true? Because for the vast majority of people, unless you have a medical condition, right? Some people do have obsessive compulsive disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, who actually have gone to the doctor and gotten a real diagnosis. Very few people actually have this. It's about 3% of the general population. So there's a 97% chance that's not you. And then I put this simple challenge and I say, okay, let's say, so you're, you're having trouble writing a script, for example. You find yourself getting bored, you're checking Instagram. If I told you, hey, uh, if you don't work on this script for the next 30 minutes, you're going to have to pay me $10,000. You're going to have to pay me $10,000. Can you work on that script for that half an hour? Will you do it? Yeah. What, what did you say? 100%. Yeah. No doubt. Okay. So we've already established you can. When you make a pact, when you make a commitment, we've already established you can. Now we're just negotiating the price. So when you use these four, and I'm just giving you tidbits, right? Just little little hints here. There's lots, lots, and lots of more techniques here. But if you use those four steps in concert, knowing what to do when you feel the internal trigger, mastering the internal trigger, making time for traction by putting that in your calendar so that you know the difference between traction and distraction, hacking back the external triggers, and then finally preventing distraction with a pact. There's other kind of pacts as well we can talk about. If you do one small thing from each of these four strategies, I promise you, you will become indistractable. Let's go through a quick summary of everything we've learned so far. Number one, the biggest problem is that even when we know what to do, we don't do it. This is a problem that even Nireal faced after the success of his first book, Hooked. Therefore, we need to figure out why are we not able to focus on things that are good for us. Number two, 
checking emails or slack might look like work but in reality they are still distractions we often feel that getting work related distractions are not distractions but a form of productivity but in reality they are just like any other bad distraction number 3 getting rid of technology will not fix your problem your core issues most probably stem from intrinsic emotions and not just from external triggers there's a huge chance that even if you were to keep your phone away you would still get distracted because you're not dealing with the feelings that distract you you aren't recognizing the core emotions that are pulling you off track number 4 the first step towards becoming indistractable is to master your internal triggers 90% of the time we get distracted is a response to feelings like boredom and anxiety number 5 indistractable people use their discomfort as rocket fuel to fight distraction your cta is to start being mindful anytime you feel like checking your phone ask yourself is this boredom or anxiety or just fear of missing out then figure out how do you resolve those internal triggers number 6 if it's not on calendar it will get distracted you can't call something a distraction unless you know what it is distracting you from which means that if you're trying to write a script or do a task for 30 minutes let it be on your google calendar tell yourself that in these 30 minutes i will not do anything but work on my task your cta is to start blocking time slots in your day for one good habit and one 30 minute slot of deep work make sure you put 30 minute buffers in between your slots so you don't over complicate your calendar also don't split your entire day into blocks as well always start slow on number 7 we need to be generous with our money and cheap with time because you can always make more money but you cannot always make more time you can download a free pdf of all of these notes by going to the link in description make sure you click on subscribe and hit the bell icon because we regularly come with amazing podcasts that is absolutely incredible near like it is crazy how much you have put into this answer mm-hmm. and it it takes me back to the time when i was reading hook because you won't believe it i've read hook two three times i we did a very detailed youtube video breaking down even a single paragraph so it's insane the kind of insight and thoughts you've added to this and so i like my only question to you is that let's say i decide that i will write a script or i will go to the gym the second thing that holds me back is just discipline because when the time comes i don't feel like doing it and then i feel right. guilty for not having enough discipline so how do i fix that well you shouldn't need discipline and in fact you know psychology is showing that this whole concept of willpower is a lie it's not true in fact we used to think a few years ago about a decade ago we used to believe this thing in the psychology community called ego depletion ego depletion said that uh willpower runs out like battery on your phone that it depletes okay and many people believe this still to this day or even if they don't know it's called ego depletion they will say things like i used to say i'd get home from work after a hard day uh i don't feel like going to the gym right now i'm spent quote unquote so give me some ice cream i'm going to sit on the couch and watch tv right because i don't have enough discipline i ran out of willpower turns out that that concept there there were some studies by the way that that showed that ego depletion uh was real but then as as often happens in the in the social sciences when something sounds too good to be true we replicate the study we try and run it again and it turns out that it does not replicate that this concept of ego depletion that that willpower that discipline runs out like gas in a gas tank turns out is not true except in one group of people there is one group of people who really do they really do run out of discipline they really do run out of willpower and those people and only those people are people who believe that willpower is a limited resource and this is so important because what you are being fed from the media is that technology is addictive that it's hijacking your brain that uh that that it's 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 you know it's stealing your focus it's not stealing our focus we're giving it away so when we believe these myths like i'm out of discipline i have no more willpower i'm addicted to technology when you believe these lies they become true they become true <laughs> it's called learned helplessness 
And so we know this is a, this is a very well studied psychological phenomenon that when people believe that there's nothing to be done, what do they do? Nothing. So the worst thing you can tell yourself is, I don't have any discipline. I'm no good at time management. I have undiagnosed ADHD. I have an addictive personality. No, you don't. I mean, some people do have medical conditions, okay? There is an asterisk there. Some people really do have medical conditions. There's a 97 to 99% chance that is not you. And if it is you, you should go to a doctor, okay? And actually get that diagnosis. But for the vast majority of people, they don't have anything wrong with them other than the fact that, as Henry Ford said, whether you believe you can or you can't, it's true. So the first thing to do is to take that vocabulary out of your mouth. Never ever say again, I don't have enough discipline because the whole concept is not true. You have as much willpower as you want, okay? Now, what you did say, which is very true, is that sometimes you don't feel like it. That is very, very true. Uh, you know what the number one reason people don't achieve their goals is? What's the number one reason? It's pretty common sense. The number one reason people don't achieve their goals is because they quit, right? I had a goal, New Year's resolution to get in shape. Why didn't you? I stopped going to the gym. I quit. I wanted to write a book. I wanted to start a business. I wanted to find love. I wanted whatever. Why? Why didn't you get those goals? Number one reason, you quit. Why do people quit? The number one people, the number one reason people quit is because they didn't feel like continuing, right? It was too hard. It was too difficult. That to me is actually quite liberating. Right? Some people hear that and say, oh, it's hopeless. To me, that's incredibly liberating because the reason people accomp didn't accomplish their goal, it wasn't that uh, they didn't have the money, they didn't have the time, they didn't have the resources. Those rank also, but that's not the number one reason. The number one reason people don't continue with the goal, the number one reason people quit is because they just didn't feel like it. They could have, they could have found a way, but they didn't feel like it. So if all it is, is a feeling, that's all it is, which by the way, is the source of all human motivation. We used to think that human motivation was about carrots and sticks, right? About the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. Freud said something like this. Uh, Jeremy Bentham said something like this. Turns out it's not true. Neurologically speaking, everything you do, everything, every action, every click, every purchase, everything you do, you do for only one reason. And that is the desire to escape discomfort. All human behavior is spurred by a desire to escape discomfort. Even wanting to feel good is itself psychologically destabilizing. Wanting, craving, lusting after something is uncomfortable. So the way the brain gets us to do stuff is by making us feel bad enough to go get it. And so knowing that fact that all human behavior is about a desire to escape discomfort, that's easy. Now all we have to do is to modulate our mood. Right? We just have to tell ourselves, oh, I, it's just a feeling. And you know what? Nothing in life worth having doesn't require some effort. That's part of it, right? You want to find love? It's going to take some effort. You want to have a good relationship with your spouse. If you want to start a business, it's going to take hard work. If you want to do something great in life, if you want to, if you want to exercise, it's going to take hard work. That's the, what comes on the other side of that effort is progress, is, is personal achievement, is making the world better. It never comes easy. Nothing in life worth having is easy. So once you have a different script, I think the conventional script that we're taught in the media is that feeling bad is bad, right? How many self-help books are about being happy, right? And I would argue that that is not evolutionarily consistent, that, that we are not evolved to be happy. Right? Happy is, happiness is a fleeting sensation. I mean, think, I'll prove it to you. Think about if there was ever a tribe of human beings, let's say 200,000 years ago on the plains of the Serengeti, if there was two, a, a tribe of humans who somehow were completely blissed out, right? They were always satisfied. They were always happy. Everything was always fantastic. They never wanted for anything. And then, one day, they meet our ancestors, right? They, pe they meet the people that we are genetically evolved from. People who are always wanting and craving and lusting and never satisfied. What would happen between those two tribes of people? I'll tell you exactly what would happen. Our ancestors would have killed and eaten them. That's what would have happened. Because you don't want a species to be content all the time. If you want a species to make their lot better, you want them to be dissatisfied, right? That's what helped us create life-changing medicine and overturn despots and go to the moon was because we were unsatisfied. We wanted more. So the first thing to convince yourself of is that not feeling like it is natural. That is the normal baseline human condition. It's not a deficiency. You don't lack discipline. You lack the right perspective. Nobody feels like it. And so what you're doing essentially is repeating to yourself this awareness 
that that discomfort is a tool. It's something you can use as rocket fuel to propel you forward rather than trying to escape with one distraction or another. So what are some tools you can use? What can you do? So I'll, I'll, I'll give you some examples. So again, you have to use all these four techniques in concert. Okay. And sometimes some techniques are going to be more effective than others. So for example, to, to make sure you want to go to the gym, you know, I would probably focus on uh, uh, making it as easy as possible to, to do some kind of physical activity. It doesn't have to be you're going to lift 100 you know, pound weights and, and torture yourself. Maybe having some kind of pact, like having a friend that's going to wait there for you, or maybe hiring a trainer. There's all kinds of things you can do to put yourself into some kind of pact. Again, if, if your friend was going to be there and you're not, and they're like, hey, I showed up, where the hell are you? That's a pact, right? You're more, much more likely to show up if you know your friend is waiting. And, and, and so the more you can use those type of techniques. But let's, let's talk about the first step in terms of internal triggers. So for me personally, something I do every single day as a professional writer is write. And writing is never easy. It's always hard freaking work. <laughs> every day, all I do when I, when I write, all I want to do is go Google something or check email or check what's happening in the news. Uh, that's all I want to do is to not do the actual work. So what do I do? I'll tell you very personally what I do for, for, for myself is uh, I use a technique called the 10-minute rule. The 10-minute rule says that you can give in to any distraction, any distraction, whether it's smoking that cigarette if you're trying to quit, whether it's that piece of chocolate cake that might take you off track if you're on a diet, whether it's checking Instagram, whatever it might be, you can do it. No problem. You can do it, but not right now. Not right now. You can do it in 10 minutes, in 10 minutes. And you can do pretty much anything for just 10 minutes. So here's what I do. So when I feel like, oh, I, I really want to go get distracted and do something that's not writing, I take a deep breath, say, okay, I set up a timer for 10 minutes, I put my phone down, and now I have a choice to make. For those 10 minutes, I can either get back to the task at hand, I can get back to the writing, or I can do what's called surfing the urge. Surfing the urge acknowledges that these emotions, boredom, loneliness, fatigue, all this, these uncomfortable sensations, they're like waves. They crest and then they subside. But that's not how most people think about it. Most people, when they think about these emotions, they think, oh, I'm bored. I'm always going to feel bored. I'm, uh, uh, I'm tired. I'm always going to be tired. I, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm frustrated. I'm always going to be frustrated. That's not how emotions work. Emotions are fleeting, right? So if you can learn to ride that wave, to ride that urge like a surfer on a surfboard, you will find that by the time the 10 minutes are up, you'll be back at the task at hand. So one technique that I use almost every day is when I feel that internal trigger, when I feel bored, lonely, indecisive, uncertain, whatever it is, I close my eyes for a minute and I repeat this mantra. Now you can steal this mantra, you can make up your own mantra, whatever's meaningful to you. But this, the mantra that I repeat to myself is this. I close my eyes and I say, this is what it feels like to get better. This is what it feels like to get better. And I just sit with that sensation. I've changed the story about why I feel the way I do. You know, I'm feeling stressed about my writing because this is really important to me and I want it to really resonate with my readers. As opposed to, I lack self-discipline and I'm not very good, right? I'm changing the perspective to serve me rather than hurt me. And just by doing that, by learning these techniques, and there's many, many, many others in the book as well, by learning that technique, what you will find is by the end of the 10 minutes, you'll be back at the ta task at hand. And if 10 minutes are too much, do it for five minutes. And if 10 minutes isn't enough and you can do more, great. Because now what you're doing is you're proving to yourself, hey, you know what? I can do this, right? Because the 10 minute rule becomes the 15 minute rule, becomes the 20 minute rule, becomes the one hour rule. And you're building your agency. You're freeing yourself from these shackles, these mind shackles that you have put on yourself saying, I don't have enough discipline. This, isn't, this doesn't feel good. I don't wanna do it. I don't feel like it. You're freeing yourself to now realize, wait a minute, I actually can do this right? I'm just going to do it for 10 minutes. So don't make it a big deal to go to the gym or, you know, work on a big project. Just make it, I'm going to do 10 minutes, but I'm going to do nothing but that thing that I said I was going to do. That's it. And then over time, that 10 minute rule becomes longer and longer and longer as you prove to yourself you're capable of controlling your time and attention. That is insane. Like the way you've changed the narrative. And do you have any other affirmations just like this? Well, that's, that's the one that's been serving me for the past uh, several years since I, since I did the research for the book. It works really, really well. But I encourage people, of course, you can steal this one if it works for you. But I, I encourage you to, to, to use what works best for you. I'll, I'll give you another affirmation in a different context. You know, uh, distraction is very context specific. Distracts you while you're writing, for example, is going to be very different from what might distract you while you're at the dinner table and you find yourself reaching at your phone as opposed to being with your 
your family. So one thing that, that one, one train of negative thoughts I used to experience used to be around um, getting on stage. So I'm a professional speaker and author. And one thing you don't want as a professional speaker and author is stage fright. But I used to have terrible, terrible stage fright. Uh, I would go, you know, about to give a talk and I would feel the my, my heart pumping in my chest and I would feel my armpits start to get sweaty and my mouth would get super dry and I'd get really nervous. And the narrative I was telling myself in my head was, you know what, I'm not very good at this. I should have prepared more. I'm a fraud. I'm an imposter. Uh, you know, real speakers don't feel this way. Maybe this isn't for me. I would tell myself all these lies that weren't serving me until I learned the techniques that are now in Indistractable and I changed the narrative. Just like I changed the narrative around whenever I felt distracted around writing. Now, before I get on stage, let me tell you, I swear I get the same physical reactions. I still feel my heart pumping in my chest. I still get the sweaty armpits. I still get the dry mouth, but I've changed the narrative. Now the narrative I repeat to myself is, okay, I feel this way because my heart is pumping faster to give my brain more oxygen so I can give my best possible presentation. Same sensation, different interpretation. And that's what we all need to do. That's a key part of mastering those internal triggers so they don't master you, is reinterpreting them. Not using them as uh, something that, that reinforces an identity you don't want, right? Don't use that feeling as something that says, oh, you don't have discipline and you're not focused and you're bad and no, 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 no. Change the narrative. Change it, for example, when I don't feel like going to the gym and I feel, you know, I'm feeling a little lazy. I don't tell myself, ah, oh, you're feeling lazy, you're no good at this, you're never going to accomplish your, your physical fitness goals. No, I say, you know what? If it was easy, everyone would do it. And that's what makes this special. You can't buy a good looking body. I don't care how rich you are. You can buy a Ferrari, you can buy a Lamborghini, you can buy a fancy house. You can't buy a six pack, can't buy it. You gotta put in the work, <laughs> right? And so it's that type of, it, it, whatever works for you. That's what works for me, it motivates me. All of us have to figure out for ourselves how to reimagine that internal trigger. I am just so excited to put this on the internet and have all of my comment section just go <laughs> because this is like these are insane mind hacks. And uh, you know, I know that you have limited time, so I really wanted to ask this that with so much of AI, AR, VR coming in, do you see the world of design going in a different direction? Like, do you think this is going to be a negative outcome? And what are your views on AI and AR? Yeah, I, I so this this is now uh, a pivot just to bring everyone along away from indistractable and more towards uh, hooked. Although there is a connection to, between the two, in that I think what's what's going to happen. So uh, when I wrote indistract, sorry, when I wrote hooked uh, back in 2014, that was published. I could see a lot of this already coming. And in fact, I wrote many articles back in the day about what what I called conversational commerce or conversational UI. Uh, and, and today, you know, we don't call it conversational UI anymore. We call it LLMs. We call it you know the the, the, or, or chat GPT, where we're talking to a technology that feels almost human. I think the natural evolution of what's going to be uh, mass personalization for every conceivable business. I think there will be an age very quickly here in the next five to 10 years, every business will be expected to personalize their product in the same way that TikTok and Instagram personalize your feed, many businesses will be, will, the customer will expect you to personalize the product based on their tastes and preferences. And that's a huge, huge opportunity, right? If you're of one generation, then things should look a certain way. If you have particular tastes and preferences, then the user experience should be tailored to the way you wanna see it. And so that fits into what I call the investment phase of the hook model in that the more you use the product, the better it becomes. And so that's actually quite a revolution. If you think about it, in the history of manufacturing, most products depreciate, right? The more I write with this pen, the more I you know, use my air conditioner, I don't know, all these products, they lose value the more you use them with wear and tear. We call this depreciation. What we're going to see now with mass personalization made possible through artificial intelligence is that you're going to have products that appreciate with use. They're gonna get better and better and better because they're gonna get smarter and more personalized based on your data. And so that's gonna make many products much easier to use. I think it's gonna, it's gonna, for the consumer, it's gonna be very good. I think it's gonna benefit largely the incumbents or the people who can make the tools that the incumbents use, right? So I think it's, from what I've seen to date, it's going to benefit the bigger companies that already have a relationship with the user. Um, but I think every business is going to be expected uh, very shortly to, to do this kind of mass customization or they're going to be left in the dust. But that is insane. And uh, so I, I, you said that you write articles on this as well. We know about your books and folks, uh, we are having a giveaway where when you dock 
document all of your learnings if you put it on linkedin you tag me and neer and top 3 winners will get a hard copy of hooked and indistractable delivered to their doorsteps uh, but apart from these things neer where can we learn more from you do you write do you have a newsletter absolutely so you can go to my blog neerandfar.com neer is spelled like my first name so n i r a n d f a r so near and far.com and i publish uh, i have two actually newsletters so you you sign up based on your interest if you want more about how to build habits then you'll if you're a product designer then you'll get more of the hooked stuff if you're interested in how to hack back the bad habits how to break the bad habits and how to be indistractable then there's another lo- newsletter there as well and they go out alternatively every week and we have a community of ux designers Um, are there any specific roadmaps or advice that you'd like to give UX designers so that they can upskill themselves in 2024? So I I still think that um, consumer psychology for design professionals is underrated. We went through, you know, when I started along this line, when I started teaching at Stanford, um, I had to convince people that these companies were using consumer psychology. But I don't have to convince anybody anymore, right? We all know that uh, the, the the Metas and the Amazons and the Googles of the world, they they, they all use these type of, of techniques because they work. <laughs> so I don't have to convince anybody anymore that this is used, but I still don't see the mass adoption of consumer psychology in the in the UX profession. I think it's because there's just not that generation of teachers that have really come in from industry to teach these kind of practices. Uh, so unfortunately, all we have is, you know, the mass market books like mine, uh, which I think are a good, a good first step. But there's so much more to learn when it comes to consumer psychology principles. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. And thank you so much for doing this, Neil. Before this episode ends, let's quickly revise what we've learned so far in the second half. Number one, most people believe that willpower is a limited resource. But in reality, it's not. It only depends on how you think and what you believe about willpower. If your brain truly believes that your willpower is limited, then it will be limited. Otherwise, you can extract infinite amounts of willpower. It is all a matter of how you think and what you believe in. Number two, stop expecting yourself to be happy all the time. Most self-help content would suggest that feeling bad is bad. But being happy all the time is not evolutionary consistent. We are not evolved to be happy all the time. Happiness is a fleeting sensation. Evolution would never want a species who's content and happy all the time. Having the desire to do more, to get more, to experience more is what drives us to move forward. Number three, use the 10-minute rule and surf the urge to fight bad distractions or habits. If you get an urge to do something, then try your level best to wait for 10 minutes. Tell yourself, not right now. You can pretty much do anything in those 10 minutes. Nireyal does this all the time. He practices surfing the urge where he would acknowledge the emotion and give it time to eventually tone itself down. On number four, Understand that emotions like boredom, loneliness, and fatigue act like waves. They rise and then they eventually come down to subside. But most people don't think about them going down. Most people assume that they will always feel these uncomfortable emotions at high intensity. Emotions are fleeting. If you learn to ride that wave, you'll always have more leverage. And in the end, for number five, Change how you interpret your body's emotional state. Reframe your experiences in positive ways. For example, earlier, Neer would feel imposter syndrome anytime he would stand backstage before his talk. He would feel bad about himself because he used to create a negative narrative in his brain. But now, he has reframed the same body sensations in a new positive way. Now, when he gets the same experiences, the same increased heartbeat, He tells himself that I feel this way because my heart is pumping faster to give my brain more oxygen so I can give my best possible presentation. Your CTA is to be very careful of how you speak to yourself. You might know how to speak to your best friends and your family members and your colleagues, but you might be really, really bad at speaking to yourself. How you perceive your body's sensation, how you think about yourself matters a lot. Make sure that you catch yourself 
any time you frame your natural responses and emotions in a negative way. I am so glad that you took out the time for this and I'm really really excited for you to come back to India and you know just to learn from you in person. My pleasure. Yeah, looking forward to meeting. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Uh Thank folks, you. this was the Cutting Edge show. Make sure you click on subscribe and hit the bell icon because we regularly come up with videos around UX and AI. With that being said, I hope that you're taking care of your mind and body. This is your dost Ansh Mehra signing out. If you like this episode then make sure you watch the next one in the same playlist right here we've been making some amazing content and i'm pretty sure that you will also like the next video in queue